in every one of the many commencement addresses that I you know, watched online or read, the speakers invariably said the same thing, that they didn't remember a single thing their commencement speaker said. That was pretty daunting, I have to tell you. Uh, so, I have to admit, I don't either. In fact, uh, Paul Hawking, an incredible activist, environmentalist, and dark commencement speaker, and I frankly don't remember a single thing he said back in 2002 when I crossed the stage. It was something about the earth dying, and I'm just glad it hasn't yet. So I don't expect you to remember anything that I say today. Not one thing. However, I'm going to challenge you to remember two things you already know, and I'm specifically directing this to the graduates, so parents and others can join in if you'd like. The first thing is where you came from. Where you came from. And the second thing is why you got into design in the first place, or the work you did in the first place. It sounds pretty simple, right? Yet in life as in design, sometimes the simplest things are the most complicated. But remembering where you came from and why you got into this work in the first place is a challenge and it's one worth fighting for. And in doing so, simply keeping in mind these things you already know, I promise you'll make a life that you and your families and your faculty and your peers can be proud of. So let me practice what I preach here. At 34, I'm really just a kid from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I grew up the second oldest of six children, Danny, Johnny, Megan, Molly, Andy, and Colleen. Yes, we're Irish, yes, we're Catholic, and very hardworking. And I'll take a little aside here to point out that um, one of the graduates that I met yesterday at the Landscape Architecture Reception is one of 17 children. Jose Zamora, right up here. Phenomenal. I practically wept when he spoke yesterday. It was uh, unbelievable. Back to the hard working. My dad, John, is a 30 year nonprofit executive director, and my mom, Mary, is a 40 year registered nurse still in practice. When our family outgrew our modest home on the south side of Milwaukee, we traded our tree lined streets and narrow alleyways for an acre and a half of land, an attached garage, and virtually everything else a Midwestern family could possibly want. Except, of course, sidewalks. This was suburbia after all. No sidewalks there. But reflecting on where I came from, I realize how much it shaped my understanding of design, and I'm certain it's the case for the graduates, and I know it's the case for you all in the audience. In my case, I remember looking around my hometown and sensing an absence, a lack of good design and sensible planning in places where it was most in need. I started asking questions. Why were the private schools so pristine and open, while the public schools across town were falling apart with barred windows and metal detectors? Why were some of the hospitals my mom worked in comfortable spaces of healing and other ones drab and uninspiring and depressing environments? Why were our roads ever widening, but still without sidewalks? Even though I didn't meet an actual architect, landscape architect, city planner, or others in these fields until I went to college, I had a hunch that they, that we, have a capacity to heal broken parts of cities. My years as an undergraduate student at the University of Minnesota provided my first memorable exposure to what most of us think of as architecture and, and um, planned environments, those being beautiful buildings and public spaces, nearly a whole campus of them. My freshman dorm was immediately down the, the street from Frank Gehry's art museum there. But I also learned about activism and leadership in Minnesota, and I'm so glad that there's so many graduates learning about those two things here at Berkeley. So with an appetite for activism, I decided on Berkeley and showed up for my first visit with a duffel bag of shorts, t-shirts, <laughs> and flip-flops. I was heading to this sunny place called California, right? <laughs> Not today. That was a little more than a decade ago. Grad school here at Berkeley didn't exactly get off to a good start. My first semester, I barely passed the introductory structures class that I'm certain most graduates on this class, on this stage, aced. <laughs> to make matters worse, I was very publicly reprimanded, literally shamed for that low grade, when an architecture department staff member inadvertently forwarded an email about my structures played to the entire department. 
the students at all. <laughs> it was a horribly embarrassing moment for me, and no doubt for this person in the department. I practically thought it was the end of my life at the time, and now I just look back on it and laugh. It's amazing how time adds perspective. Rather than run for the hills, on the brink of graduating with my master's, I enrolled in a PhD in architecture program with the intention on focusing on, on studying the culture of the profession. Yet a year into my PhD coursework and research, at the ripe age of 26, I was recruited away to launch and direct that national nonprofit organization that Rafa mentioned, called Public Architecture, which was uniquely focused on the culture of the design professions. It presented an opportunity to learn how to build and run an organization. It was a chance to make a real impact. But most of all, it was a way to reconnect with why I went to architecture school in the first place. A year into my tenure as executive director, I relaunched that pro bono service program, which would come to challenge every member of the design profession to pledge 1% of their time to pro bono service. About two dozen firms had signed on at that time. About 750, apparently, when Rafi was writing my introduction. <laughs> and today, nearly 1,000 design firms have said that they will pledge their time to pro bono service, leveraging an estimated $35 million in donated services annually. Since my departure, the program has been ably directed by one of Berkeley's own Master of Landscape Architecture graduates, Amy Rez, a wonderful young woman who I hired initially as an AmeriCorps VISTA fellow. Uh, she's an incredible person doing great work. But since leaving that organization in San Francisco, I've resided on the East Coast and had a bumpy run trying to save another fledgling but really important urban advocacy organization. And I've otherwise devoted my time to speaking and writing about the growing pro bono service movement. The latter work is what keeps me up at night and what gets me out of bed in the morning. I was speaking recently and was asked, how did you ever think to get into this kind of work? And I paused. And it wasn't for dramatic effects. It was because I was really struck by that question. And it's probably one that I've been asked a million times and that I know that other graduates here will be asked throughout their career. And I said, from the bottom of my heart, this is what I thought architecture and design were all about. People applauded spontaneously, as if they had never heard such a thing before. Yet I knew they had. They had heard it in themselves. I'm convinced we all have. But in the process of our education, our trains become licensed professionals, the process of becoming tenured professors, I worry that truth, that first knowing, is lost at worst or tempered at best. We sometimes get so wrapped up in the process, or what others expect us to do, that we lose sight of why we came to this work in the first place. One of the unexpected highlights of my time at Berkeley was serving on the Graduate Admissions Committee. For what was probably only an afternoon, I sat around a conference table with Professors Mary Camario and Gail Brager and certainly a few others. We read personal statement after personal statement from these aspiring architects wanting to make the world a better place. Someone so far has to say they wanted to change the world or save the world. A small percentage of those, percentage of those idealists would ultimately be admitted. Their idealism, I worry, diminished when already late nights quickly turned into all-nighters in studio. And any lingering idealism was further tempered when their final studio reviews devolved into some posturing, which we might have experienced, between distinguished critics, rather than focus on actual client or community experiences or the perceptions of the project at hand. But graduates, here you are, about to walk across the stage, a perfect moment to reflect back and reconnect with those initial instincts. There's a lot of grumbling right now about how hard it is to find a job in the design field or a municipal work. I take a different view. I think this could be one of the best and most important moments for designers to find and carve out roles in other sectors. There are enough designers working for the moment in design firms. There are not, however, nearly enough of us working in government, in schools, in public health. Mm serving in the Merit Corps, serving in the Peace Corps, or working in the nonprofit sector more broadly. These are unmatched opportunities to move the needle in organizations or entire sectors where design or design thinking has been overlooked or taken for granted for too long. If I were you, I would make this plan A, 
not plan C or D. After all, the, most, the only thing more important than good designers are good clients. For those who enter traditional design and planning practices, I implore you to listen to and honor your future clients in every way you know how. At least in my day, it's something that didn't earn much focus in school. And to this day in practice, at least in architecture, clients are paid little more than lip service in our array of self-congratulatory award programs, design competitions, professional associations, the press, etc. But these graduates have the chance to change that. This was all too apparent in my recent book that Rafi mentioned, called The Power of Pro Bono, became the first design book ever published to give clients an equal voice. With an ample supply of gorgeous photographs, even contributions from some renowned designers, the book could have ended up looking like just every other design book. What would have been lost were the first-hand accounts of users and client descriptions of design that were more moving than most of the words even the most articulate of architects, and a chance to get a glimpse inside the social impact of design. In Pax Christian, Mississippi, the client from the cover photo of my book said, I love our new building. Shot the architects designed the most soaring, lyrical, magical roof ever. It looks like whale bones or the ribs of a boat. We could use that roof today. <laughs> People see all sorts of things in that roof. A local resident involved with a partially built master plan adjacent to an iconic abandoned tra train station in Detroit says simply, we live in a city, Detroit, where everyone talks about things falling down, and now there is this hope of creating something new and beautiful again. I believe we all have the responsibility and the opportunity to engage in design for the public good. One of my life's wishes is that I could point new graduates to a design version of Teach for America or something of the sort. I wish I could point you to the well-charted public interest law career that awaits graduates of Gold Hall. The fact that we as a profession and a society have not created such a path need not stop you from doing what you want to do and what you see needs doing. Opportunities abound. It doesn't require you to give all your time away. It doesn't require you to found a nonprofit organization. It doesn't even require you to work for one. It only requires you to remember two things. Where you came from and why you got into design in the first place. I'm just a kid from Milwaukee who wondered why some people got cathedrals and others got trailers. I've had fancy fellowships and awards. I'm giving a commencement address at Berkeley, something I never imagined I would be asked to do. But the best affirmation I've ever received was from my 85-year-old grandmother in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. After reading my book, she wrote these words. I thought the other day as I sat in the doctor's office how depressing it was from the color on the wall to the carpet on the floor. The second and third paragraphs of the first chapter of your book express exactly what I felt. Now I will have to call who is responsible for the drabness in that place. <laughs> Any grandmothers out there? Yeah. If you're a grandmother, you know what comes next. I did call. And I got the man in charge, and he said he appreciated someone calling regarding the space. My doctor's office is on the list for an upgrade, and he's going to look into the other spaces that they own as well. It is always good to express one's opinion if done in the proper manner. Thank you, Grandma. <laughs> if a few paragraphs, if a few paragraphs in a grandson's book can produce this, imagine what you graduates can do to change hearts and minds about the role and importance and relevance of design in our society. Graduates, why did you get into this work in the first place? Really, I want you to think about it. Remember why. Because that's all, and that's enough. Thank you. Mm.